All right, before I get into the sermon, that's the title of my sermon today, um, I like to usually use the anniversary, uh, church anniversary, to recognize a few people that I think make a, a sizable contribution to the church here. So I want to do that uh, this morning and just honor them uh, amongst the church today. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean people that are not recognized are not valued at all. Obviously, you know, we can't give, we can't give everyone a sticker. You know, this is not the liberal left movement where everyone gets a prize. But it's not to say that there aren't many people that contribute to the success of this church. But today, I just wanted to uh, mention two people in particular that I think in their attitude, in how they go about serving, uh, also uh, in their conduct as a Christian as well, but also in their contribution in terms of how much they put into this church. So I thought I would recognize uh, one man and one woman. Obviously, these people are not perfect. Nobody is perfect. But uh, in my opinion, I believe in our church, these people do lead, like I said, in their example, in their conduct, in their behavior, uh, in their contribution to this church, and also in their attitude in how they serve. So I want to honor them today so they can be an example for everyone else in the church. So first of all, I'd like to have Nathan. You want to come up? Thank you so much, Nathan, for the blessing. Nathan's a blessing to our family, so he's, and he does a lot around the church. So it's just a token of appreciation. Thank you, yeah, thanks so much, Nathan. <laughs> okay, yeah, Nathan does a heap around the church. He's been a real blessing to my family. Um, he does a lot at here as well, and I think he, he's uh, definitely a good example for everybody to follow. Now, obviously, you know, he's not perfect. You know, we all have our flaws. I've got flaws as well. But I think he's definitely leading the pack. Um, the other person I'd like to recognize is Philippa. So, Philippa, you want to come up? Uh, yeah. <laughs> cool. yeah, I did. <laughs> and like I said, you know, not everyone's perfect. You know, I know, I've known Philippa for a long time. We've known her for many years. And obviously, if you know Philippa very well, you know, obviously, you know she's got flaws as well. We all have flaws. But in terms of the way she serves, I think the way she presents herself, also her faithfulness and soul winning. You know, she, she, she does a lot in the back. She does things without being asked. Like there are times we've had events and she'll bring flowers to decorate the place. So I just want to recognize that today. Thank you so much, Philippa. There you go. Okay, and that's why I'm uh, preaching on this topic today. I think there's a few uh, things uh, today that we can learn from Romans 16 and a few other passages we'll be going to. Um, but you know, public recognition is biblical. You know, a lot of people think, ah, oh, you know, you do things for the Lord and uh, they shouldn't be recognized, it should all be in secret. But, you know, and I guess I get there's a, there's a part of uh, doing things for the Lord where you're not glorying in men. Um, but there is a side, as we saw in Romans 16, there is uh, a place for recognition in God's body. You know, the Bible says, you know, don't, don't be praised by your own mouth. You know, let another man praise thee. So there is place for praise. And when you read Romans 16, sometimes you'll read through chapters of the Bible and you just think, I, I don't, why is that chapter there? You know, there's just a whole chapter of just name after name after name after name after name. And probably when, maybe when Ashton was reading Romans 16, you just started to switch off because it's just name after name. But you know the point that God is making with Romans 16? is that the reason why the church in Rome was so successful is because it wasn't just one person doing the work, right? And that's why there's name after name because it's recognizing the people that are contributing in the church there and making that church as successful as it was. So as we, you read through, you know, verses 1 to 16, where it's just this helper, that helper, this helper, that helper, you can see it's not just one or two people that made the church in Rome the great church that it did. Not only is Paul recognizing people at the church in Rome, right? So it says here, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. Look at this, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. That's how he starts the epistle. And how he ends the epistle is recognizing 
why that church had a faith that was spoken of throughout the whole world because it was a church where many people were involved in the work and you know if we want to be a church where our faith is spoken of throughout the whole world everybody needs to be involved everybody needs to take their part take on board their part in the body of christ and run with it to the best of their ability to the glory of god and you know what god will see our church like the church in rome i hope that's the case so like i said public recognition is biblical and that's what we see in in romans 16 proverbs 27 let another man praise thee and not thine own mouth a stranger and not thine own lips so you see the problem with worldly praise generally is people are praising themselves you know they're talking themselves up and unfortunately in this world this is how they teach you to get ahead as opposed to letting your work speak for themselves and the bible says let another man praise thee and you know what even if you know you might be thinking hopefully you're not thinking today you know i do a lot for the lord victor didn't recognize me like i already said you know not everyone can be at the top so i just honor a couple of people but you know it's not even about striving to be recognized by man you know because if you're just striving if you're just working for god to be recognized by me you're working for the wrong person right you don't serve to be recognized by me or to be recognized by people in the church no ultimately you're doing it to be recognized by god you know and if you're doing the right thing people people will praise you you know it's funny when we talk about paul having help you know the, the the church in rome many people coming together i don't know if you noticed when ashton was reading romans 16 that paul didn't even write the epistle of rome so you know you think about the the letters that paul wrote people say like well they're paul's letters do you know that he didn't even write them all he spoke them all but he spoke them through the through the holy spirit but in romans 16 it says here i tertius who wrote this epistle salute you in the lord so you see paul even had people helping him to write down his letters and that's a that, this is obviously a pattern of how we are delivered the bible where the holy men of god spake as they were moved by the holy ghost and then people pen them down so it's it's not even about you know because people will say like well it's just the scriptures that were physically penned down by the apostles so i mean it was tertius inspired you know well, tertius was just writing down what was inspired which was the spoken word of god we see this in other places of the bible as well where we see multiple people being mentioned to do a great work for god so in the new testament we see that building the house of god was the new testament of the shadow in the old testament which was building the temple of god and when you read chapters like this in nehemiah 3 i'm not going to read the whole chapter for the sake of time but this is what you ought to be thinking of when you read chapters like this when you read chapters like romans 16 is that there are many people doing the work to do something great for god you know i this church is not going to do something great for god just because of me you know i'm only one man yes i might be the mouthpiece for this work but the reason why this church is going to do a great work the reason why this church knocks thousands of doors over in punch bowl and thousands of doors here it's not because i knocked every door it's not because i got everybody saved when we look back at the numbers and give glory to god it's not all of victor's work so you see if it was just me those numbers would be a lot smaller i'll tell you what a lot smaller and you know we had more people getting involved in the work those numbers would be even bigger right? we'd be getting more people saved more people hearing the gospel more people reach more doors knocked more opportunity for people to believe on the lord jesus christ then eliashib the high priest rose up with his brethren the priests and they built the sheep gate they sanctified it and set up the doors of it even unto the tower of mia they sanctified it unto the tower of hananiel and next unto him builded the men of jericho so there's this picture that's being built in nehemiah 3 where these men get together almost hand in hand building the house of god or rebuilding the house of god in nehemiah 3 and next to them builded Zaka the son of Imri, and but the fish gate did the sons of Hasena build, who also laid the beams thereof and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. So I'll just read that. But if you read the whole chapter of Nehemiah 3, it just gives name after name of people helping to build the house of God. 
And like I said, even if you are not recognized by man, take comfort in the fact that God recognizes your work, no matter how small it is. You know, you might do something where it's not known at all, but you did it for the Lord. God saw that. And the Bible says here, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Not with eye service, look at this, not with eye service as men pleases. So you're not just doing things to be seen of other people. You're doing things for the Lord. But as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. So what is it saying here? Obviously the, the immediate context is employees and their bosses right but this same principle of hey when you go to work you ought not just be thinking i'm going to work to work for my boss you are going to work to work for the lord jesus christ that's why you ought to conduct yourself at work with integrity and honesty and hard work because you're not just serving your earthly master there you are serving the lord jesus christ as an ambassador as a christian if you take the name of Jesus Christ, don't take it in vain. You know, don't give the enemies of God occasion to blaspheme because you identify as a Christian, but you have a terrible testimony. So here, not with eye service as men pleases, but as the servants of Christ. So it's like, hey, we're serving God. We're not serving men. Knowing the same shall he receive of the Lord. So it's saying here that whatever you do, the good that you do, even if it's not seen by man, God sees it and he will reward you for it, whether in this life or whether in the next. So don't lose heart. Always do the right thing in every instance. Let's go on to Romans 12. So we saw Romans 16 where we see the mention. But we see this analogy uh, in the Bible of being one body. Being one body. And that analogy is used so that we understand how the church works. Because the church, this local body here, is described like a human body. So if we understand the necessity of every part of the human body and how the human body is one machine that works the best when all members are doing what they ought to, and the impact when members are not doing what they ought to, we can take heed to this analogy in the Bible and, and think about how it applies to our own spiritual life. Romans 12, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. So he's saying, hey, just like in our body, we have a lot of body parts. So this is why, you know, this, this idea of a body, this is why uh, businesses are called corporations. You know, corporate business of body and members in an organization or members in a, in a, in a body. It's this idea here. So members here is not like we think of a church membership, but that word member comes from you know, body parts. You know, members. Have not the same office. We're saying here, just the way a body has different body parts that do different things, that's how we should expect a church to be. So you know, nobody expects a church for everyone to be identical, just like a cookie cutter, like everyone looks the same and dresses the same and has the same talent and says everything the same. No, the idea is we should be different because our differences is what makes us an effective body because all members have not the same office. So we being many are one body in Christ, every one members one of another having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. So you see how the gifts that we are given from God, our talents and our abilities, are different to each other, so that they complement, so that you can fill a void in the church that somebody else can't fill. It's just like you can't just replace a body part. You know, with, with, you can't just replace an arm with an eye. You know what I mean? Like, if, if, you were losing, if you are missing a body part, something crucial is missing in that body. So we, being many, are one body in Christ. Everyone members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, where the prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. So you see here, he's giving an example now of different tasks within the church. And everyone has their part to play. Or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation. 
he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. I take that to mean, you know, these people are generous. They don't, you know, make a big fuss when they are generous with their belongings. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. So you see here what this verse is, what these verses are showing us here is that we each play a part. We need to use our abilities to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. But not only do we use our abilities to serve Jesus Christ, we have to use our abilities to the best of our ability. You know, do it with the right attitude. Do it with the best effort. effort. Do it diligently. You know, be generous if you're going to give. You know, not just, I'm not just talking about giving offerings to the church. I mean, when you're helping other people as well, you know, be generous. Make it easy for people to receive things from you. So you ought to think of your abilities, you know, when you're serving in the church. You know, how can you serve a church? You ought to be thinking of ways how you can serve the church, how you can serve, you know, in this meeting here or just serve one another. You know, maybe it's, you know, I've got some examples here. You know, maybe it's making food for people. You know, if somebody needs, needs a meal and somebody gives birth or somebody's sick and you have an ability to make nice meals that can be, you know, kept. You know, that's one way you can serve the body. Or, you know, when we, have, when we eat afterwards, you know, you can bring something. That's one way to serve. You know, there are men here that have the ability to preach, but they haven't prepared things. You see? So it's like that. It's like, you know, you have an ability. Are you using that ability to, to serve the body? You know, maybe your ability is the ability to make money. You know, that's, there's, there's people have abilities like that, where they just are business people and they know how to make money. And people like that are in church as well, to finance the rent, to, to, to be able to pay the workers, to be able to, you know, keep, this, keep the lights on. So that's another ability as well. What about if you can drive? So if you're thinking, because well, I'm giving you some examples here because people are like, you know, what, what are things that I can do in a church? You know, because I don't, people just sometimes think, well, I don't, I can't preach, I'm a lady, I can't, you know, I can't preach. Or even as a man, I can't preach, I can't sing. There's more to church than just preaching and singing. You know, there's more to church than just what you're listening to right now. There are so many other things that go on. You know, maybe you can pick people up. Maybe there's people at church that don't have a ride. You can pick people up and take them to work or take them to church. You know, technical skills. You know, people with technical ability or, you know, editing skills. You know, in, in our day and age, people that have graphic design skills, video editing skills. Hey, I mean, I would love it. You know, we got to the point where I didn't have to do all the tech and all the video editing and everything like that, that somebody could take that on and free me up to, to study more and to develop more sermons and things like that. AV skills. You know, maybe these are things that you don't have, but you can learn. I mean, we have AV that we need to set up. You know, if you, if you learn how to set all this stuff up, that's how you can be a blessing. You know, cleaning skills, cleaning things up, things like that. Organizational skills. Maybe you're somebody that's really good at organizing events. Man, it would be great. Every church needs social events where you have to organize the people, get in contact with people, call the venue, do all this. Plenty of things to do at church, social events. What about group buys? You know, you like saving money, you know, organizing an organic group buy. You know, that's something that Phil does for us all the time as well. It's another way she's a blessing to the church. You know, people can organize these things. You know, rather than thinking, well, who else is going to do it? Maybe, maybe you can do it. Uh, social events, group buys, play groups. I always hear the ladies talking about, hey, it would be so great if the kids got together, we got together. Who's going to organize it? Somebody's got to do it. These things don't just happen by themselves. You know? And think of this as an opportunity. It's an opportunity to serve. If you start thinking like, hey, I want to serve God in one way or another, I'm giving you some ideas here. There's plenty of ways you can serve the church, be a blessing to the church, edify this church that isn't the capacity of preaching or teaching. You know, there's more to church than just what you're seeing today. You know, maybe you've got some practical skills you can teach. You know, building skills, things like that. If, you know, people can learn these things, sewing, you know, hairdressing, makeup. You know, these are different things that you can teach others where you can be a blessing to other people. And maybe you don't have any of these skills and you just think, oh, I don't know how I can help. Or well, maybe you can just come early to church. Come early and help set up. You know, it doesn't take a lot of skill to put a chair out, put a table out, pull things out of the storeroom. 
plenty of things to do here. Man, if, if we had more people like Alex, Alex gets here at quarter past eight. He's usually out there waiting for me to get here. That's, that's, and I, I commend him for that. You know, if Alex wasn't here helping me set up at 8.15, I, I doubt I'd, I'd, I'd struggle to get this place set up before Kids Bible Club. So that's one way people can help. You just come early. Just set up. You know, there's so many things to take out. And for those of you who have moved things, just having that extra pair of legs to pull things out of the storeroom can save you like 10, 15 minutes. You know, because if I was here by myself, pulling everything out of the storeroom, it would take me like 10, 15 minutes just to take everything out. Whereas you halve that with two people. You have four people, you halve that again. So you can get this place set up in five, 10 minutes with maybe like 10 people. But when you have two people, it takes, you know, about 45 minutes, half an hour. So different ways you can serve. Are you using your abilities to serve Jesus? Just like Bezalel in the Bible. You've never, maybe you've never heard of that guy. Bezalel was the guy that built all the things in the tabernacle. And he was very skillful and cunning in woodwork and tapestry and all that sort of stuff. So, but he wasn't given those skills just to serve himself. He wasn't given those skills just to make a name for himself. He wasn't given those skills just to build a successful business. God gave him those skills to serve him. And the reason why you have ability, the reason why you have talent is because God gave it to you to serve him, to serve the body of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, we get more insight into this analogy of the body. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. So that's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. When you get saved, you are baptized by the Holy Ghost into the body of Jesus Christ. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles. So you see there, there's going to be cultural differences. So expect it. Don't expect everyone to just understand your culture, understand the way you show respect, understand the way your family does things. You know, there's going to be different cultures in a church. You need to be understanding of that. The way people don't always know your culture, know your expectations and likewise. So there's going to be different cultural differences, whether we be bond or free. So here we might think some people are business owners, some people are employees. You know, So it's like... There are different statues, you know, not everyone is very rich and some people are poor. There's going to be different uh, financial classes of people in the church hall. And have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, and I am, if the foot shall say, I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? You know, sometimes church members get a mentality where they're like, you know, it doesn't matter if I'm not at church. It doesn't matter if I'm not there. It doesn't matter if I don't get involved. Nobody's going to notice me. That could not be further from the truth. That's what this is talking about here. That there is a part of the body that has a part to play and they're just saying, because I don't do something else, I'm just used to it. There's no part for me to play at church. That's not true at all. Every church member has a part to play. Just your very presence at church makes a difference. Do you know that? Amen. You know, when you come to church, you encourage others to come to church. You know, when you go soul winning, you encourage others to go soul winning. When you are reading your Bible, talking about the Bible, you know what that encourages other people to do? To read their Bible. But you know, when you're not at church, you know what that does? And you don't realize it discourages people from coming to church. Because you know when there's more people at church, isn't it more exciting to be at church? Aren't you encouraged to be at church when the room is a little bit fuller? How do you feel if this room was half empty? So you see, just being here, just being present, makes a difference to the body. And you know what? The, the flip side is true. When you're not here, that affects the body. When you're not involved, that infects the body. When you don't take up responsibility in the church, that affects the body. And you know, we all have a part to play. This is what this is teaching. It's so important that you understand. I don't know what member you are of that body, but the fact that you are part of this body, you fit somewhere in the body, and if you're not doing your God-given responsibility, something's missing in that body. 
And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, so you see how it's people not recognizing their part to play and thinking just because they don't play another part in the church that they're worthless. No. I am not the eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? It's a rhetorical question. Of course it's still part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? So we see we're not, we don't all play the same role at church. And that's what you've got to realize in church. It's even with the, I, I always think of it like the relationships. Because you might think, yeah, there are some people that are in my inner circle, but you know what? There are some people that are in your inner circle that are not in my inner circle. That, you know, when I talk to, they, they go away, they flee away from me. You know, they don't want to talk to the bishop. Right? They're, they're worried that the bishop's going to pull them up on something or, you know, other people don't. Other people like that. So they're in my inner circle. They don't mind being around. Other people don't. But you know what? They might be comfortable in your inner circle. You know, and they look to you to get encouragement and think, yeah, you know what? If, my, if they don't go, I'm not going to go to church either. Yeah, if they're going to go hang out with friends on a Sunday morning, I'll, I'll just go with them too. You know, if I, and if I reach out to them, it's just, yeah, yeah, well, that's just, that's just Victor, of course. Right? So you've got you to internalize this. You've got to internalize that you play a part. You affect. There's no neutral ground in the body of Jesus Christ. It's a hard saying, but, you know, it causes us to self-reflect. I even remember when I was growing up as a Christian. It's, you know, when I was sometimes at church, even when I didn't feel like going, I didn't want to discourage others from going. So I was there anyway. You know, when, when I started singing, I sang soft. Singing is, a, you know, because people are a little bit uh, self-conscious. But when I realized this principle, I said, you know what? I think the reason why everyone in youth group is singing soft is because everyone's singing soft. So I'm just going to start singing loud to try and encourage people to sing loud. It's the same effect. So we all have a different part to play. But now if God set the members, every one of them in the body, so I'm at verse 18, as it has pleased him, and if they were all one member, where were the body? So it's not possible for us to be ultimate. But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. So what is it saying here? So first of all, you had the mentality of the member thinking they're not part of the body. They're useless, right? So you're, you know, it's like a, if we would put it in the context of a church. Ah, oh, you know, if I'm not at church, it doesn't matter, I won't be noticed. Right? That's, that's one thing. Now here it's members saying to other members that they won't be noticed, right? Saying like, you know, we don't need you, you know, when you just write people off. Like, like, you know, it's like when people leave our church, you know, I care. I care when people leave. It hurts when people leave. It hurts when people don't want to be here. Because I know they make a difference just being here, right? So we never, we never want that frame of mind like, you know, oh yeah, well, good riddance, you know? So it's like here, and the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. I just thought this was interesting that, you know, this is why, it's, this is why we use the King James. Right? Because, it's, you know, people say, why do you use the King James? Well, because it's not as simple as just taking out the these and the thous, because the these and the thous mean something. So you can't, you can't just take out the these and the thous and then you have the same Bible. You have a different Bible at that point. He says here, I have, the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, right? Because it's talking about a single hand. He says, nor again the head to the feet, two feet, I have no need of you. You see, it's, it's two, there's a difference between thee and you. Thee is singular, you is plural. So there's, there's a distinction there. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. I think this is a really interesting point if you think about it in biology. What the Bible is teaching here that sometimes the body parts that are less visible less beautiful are the ones that are actually more needed and you will find that in churches sometimes there are members in a church that you don't you know you know they don't get up and teach they don't get up and preach they're not known in the public eye maybe like somebody like me but they are a huge part of that church and i'm sure you've known people you've known people like that in our church i'm sure i'm sure you've known people like that in other churches 
where they do so much in the background that when they leave that church, there is a huge hole gaping in that church. And those members of the body which we think to be less honourable, upon these we bestow more abundant honour and our uncomely parts. What does it mean to be uncomely? Uncomely is like it's not very beautiful. It's not very pleasant to look at, right? Our comely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need. Now, what this is talking about, I believe, is in the analogy of the body in terms of the nourishment that the comely parts need, right? The, the, resource, the, 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 the part that they play in that body. It's not that the comely parts are not needed at all. But God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honour to that part which lacked that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. So what is it talking about here? I just think about in the analogy of your body, if you're missing the, 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 the wording of it here. Basically, the way I understand it here is when you look at a human body, there are parts on the human body that are visible. Right? Your hair, the, the way you look, what makes a person beautiful? Right? But the things that make a person beautiful are actually not as needed as things that are not as beautiful like your intestines, your, your heart, your liver. And in fact, these things are hidden from the body. But what do you think is more important, your heart or your hair? Your heart's more important, isn't it, than your hair. But your hair is what makes you beautiful. It's what, 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 makes, pe what makes people look at you, you know, like maybe your facial, your, your, your physical appearance, your, your outer body. But what's actually more important, what actually requires more research is actually a, a bigger part, if you were to think of, of how that body can actually run, it's the internal organs. It's the, the things that if you were to take out of the body, you're like, ugh, like some people throw up when they look at intestinal organs and look at internal organs and things like that. And he's saying here, God may have tempted the body, that, you know, put the body together that way, to make people realize, hey, it's the, the things you can't see that are actually more important. So that you don't, like at church, you don't just care about the people that are well-known, are public figures, that get up and teach. You realize there are people that are needful that are, that are in the background. And they actually do more sometimes than the people that are in the limelight. So I just think it's interesting there because if you think about, um, and uh, sort of switching topics, but you know, like a, on a health aspect, you know where, where the health, health philosophy has changed, where everyone was about treating the symptoms, looking good on the outside, you know, you want skin, you know, put on this moisturizer, put on this cream, you know, dye your hair. But what are people realizing now? It's not about just fixing the outside. You better be healthy on the inside so that it comes out on the outside. So it's the same, same uh, principle here, that if a church wants to be healthy as well, they can't just look at the physical appearance of the church. We need to look at the spiritual appearance, but also the members as well, the inner members that don't necessarily get seen. And that's why he's saying that we don't want to be a schism in the body, that, you know, because if there's a problem with the body, everyone's going to feel it. And that's why we need to make sure we look after everyone not just the people that are publicly known. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. So you see there your effect on the body. As a member of the body of Christ, as a member of, of the church, you are not an island. See, your life affects other people. This is the reality of it, guys. You just think, oh God, you know, you know, you're saying, oh Victor, you know, you're, you're being you know, so hard on us or whatever. Because I, I care about this church, you know, I want this church to succeed. Don't you want it to succeed? You know, you, you want this church to be a successful church for the Lord? So this is why it's so important that we internalize this, that we realize our effect, each one of us, on the body of Jesus Christ. Or well, one member be on it, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. I just want to focus on this phrase. This is where I get the title of my sermon. You are the body. When you talk about the church, that's you. When you say, why doesn't our church do this? Or why doesn't our church do that? Well, it's because we're not doing it. So don't think of church as them. I don't know who they are. You know, there's me. 
right? There's, there's, what I, there's what I do for the church, where when you say, hey, they should do this, you, maybe you come to church and say, oh, maybe they should do this, and they should do that. And they, they do. That's you. You are the body. So you've got to be thinking, oh, you know, I see something that needs to be fixed. Maybe I've got to fix that. I see, oh, you know, look at that rubbish. You know, look at how they got the rubbish bin. The bag's not even on there properly. Want it? You, you do it. No, no, they, you. You are the body of Christ. So not only is it in terms of responsibility, but it's what do you want this church to be? Because you are the body. Whatever you are is what this church is going to be. So think about this. If, if our church was only made up of people like you, what sort of church would that be? Think about that. That ought to convict you, right? To think, you know, if you think, think about your own spiritual life, you think, what would this church be like if everybody was like me? I sometimes think about that as well. You know, that's why that's, that spurs me on to be an example for you guys. Ye are the body. That is you. It's not somebody else. You are the church. If you want this church to be friendly, guess what? You've got to be friendly. If you want this church to be zealous about the Word of God, you've got to be zealous about the Word of God. Hey, do you want a soul-winning church? I want a soul-winning church. Don't you love going to a soul-winning church? Well, the only reason why this church is a soul-winning church is because the church goes soul-winning. The only reason why this church stands on the Word of God is because the people in the church stand on the Word of God. Okay, you are the body. It's not they are the church, you are the church. So whatever you are is what this church will be. Now let's go on to my last point and then we'll finish. We're going to look at the story of Gideon. Because like I said, when, when people say, well, why doesn't the church do this? Or why doesn't the church do that? Well, we are the church. And I always think of this story of Gideon. If you don't know the story of Gideon, uh, basically here, the Israelites are under the oppression of the Midianites. And he is hiding from the Midianites uh, because they kept stealing their wheat. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Op Ophrah, that pertained unto Josh the Abiezrite. Right? And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. If you don't know the story of Gideon, then you know, maybe you guys got to come to Kids Bible Club. I'm going through a lot of the Bible stories. And uh, you know, last week we talked about Gideon and, and the battle that he fought. Really interesting story. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And it's just very interesting because he's hiding from the Midianites and God comes to him and says hey you man of valor you brave person I don't think he's being sarcastic I think he's actually looking at you know what Gideon is going to be and Gideon said unto him oh my Lord if the Lord be with us why then is all this befallen us what is he saying here he's saying if God's with us then why are we being oppressed why is there all these problems happening and where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of, uh, of saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? So you see how Gideon looked around and, and saw all the problems he saw what could be fixed and he's saying why didn't god why god why aren't you doing anything about this and god says that's why i'm sending you and that's what we got to think about in church when you think about hey, who's going to do this who's going to do that who's going to organize these things who's going to fix this who's going to fix that hey maybe god has sent you here to fill that void that's your ministry in this church. I don't know what it could be, but God speaks to us and reveals these things to us. So when people have the mindset of, ah, oh, you know, I don't know how God can use me. I don't know if God will use me. You know, Gideon had the same thought. I'm not going to go through the whole story on the verses, but if you know the story of Gideon, it's a pretty amazing story. I mean, he didn't think he was going to get used. God said, I'm going to send you. 
He tells him to go break down the altar of Baal. He's, he's a bit scared, so he does it by night, right? He does it by night with his mates. He breaks down the altar of Baal. And in the morning, he gets in trouble, but his father stands up for him. So he gets a little bit more boldness, right? Then what he does is he calls an army. God tells him, here, we're going to go up against the Midianites, gather an army together. And... I'm just trying to remember how many people he gathered. I think he gathered like 20,000 people off the top of my head. Thousands of people. And you know what God says to him? That's too many people. You know, you're not going to deliver Israel with that many people. So he says, anybody that's scared, send them home. And I think off the top of my head, I think it's like half or two thirds of them go home. So now he's down to like 10,000 or 8,000 or something like that. And then God says, that's still too many people. So then he says to Gideon, get, every, get all the men to drink at the river. And he says, whoever drinks at the river, bowing their head like all the way to the ground, so they're at the river, like people that drink like this, as opposed to people that drink like this, they get water up to their mouth. Right? So there are some people kneeling down at the river, they'd bring the water to their mouth, and some people would put their head all the way down to drink water. And he says, whoever drinks water, bringing water to their mouth, those are the people you're going to go to battle with. And guess how many people did that? 300. Right? So it's not that... I don't even know who made that movie, 300. They didn't come up with the concept first. It was from the Bible. Gideon and his 300. Right? Not the Greeks and their 300. Not the Spartans. This is Sparta. No, this is Israel. 300. And do you know how many people died at the battle with the Medians? with the 300 people. Obviously, there was a miracle that happened where they confused the people in the camp. It was like 100... I think there was like 135,000 all up. 120,000 died when they got them all confused and then they chased 15,000 out and killed them too. 300 people. So the point is, Gideon had his doubts. You know, I, I forgot the bit about where he laid out the fleece, right? Because he was wondering, is God actually going to send him? He laid out a fleece... And he said, hey, if the fleece is wet and the ground's dry, then I know God's going to use me. And then God did that the next day. The fleece was wet and the ground was dry. And he, he still didn't, he was still doubting God. So then he laid the fleece out again and he said, oh, this time the fleece is going to be dry and the ground's wet. And then that happened. So that's the story of Gideon. I mean, if you're not aware of these stories, then you know, maybe you've got to, kind of, got to come at the 9 o'clock hour and learn some of these Bible stories when I go through them with the kids. But I think Gideon is a great example because he had doubts. He didn't know he was going to get used by God. He looked at the problems that he saw in Israel and you know what? God said, have not I sent thee. That's why you exist. You exist at this time, at this place, in this church for a purpose and if you don't fulfill that purpose, something is going to be missing. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for this church. Thank you that we've been here for four years. And I pray, Lord, that you'll continue to use us, spur us on to do greater works for you. Help us to know our place in the body of Jesus Christ so that we can fulfill the calling that you have prepared for us. So we thank you, Lord, for using us, for giving us this opportunity. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's stand and sing one last song. Let's sing to God be the glory.